Good day to you and buenos dias. You know, I haven't had much of a chance to talk to you about Mexican radio while I'm down here, or Mexican music in general, and, and I should really, because everywhere you go in Mexico, not just Mazatlan, you hear music. It's an extremely musical country, and I would say if you have a family of seven or eight people, probably six of them are playing instruments. Many of them playing guitar, many of them singing, many of them even playing in bands. And down here in Mazatlan, when you travel around, you can hear music everywhere. You hear cars going past, playing music with the windows down, playing a lot of Mexican music, also playing American music. I mentioned before Michael Jackson, Creedence Clearwater Revival, Guns N' Roses, very big bands for some reason that you hear down here. Also, though, you have a really wide variety of music that's available, and music makes its way over to radio, right? It's the basis of the content. And one of the most important types of music in Mazatlan is a music type called banda, banda. And if you listen to banda, it's a very chaotic kind of music by American standards. It's got a bunch of percussion, including snare drums. It's got clarinets. It's got guitars sometimes. And it has a tuba. A tuba, where did the tuba come from? The tuba comes from Germans. There's a lot of Germans that emigrated to Mazatlan after World War II, and they brought with them the tuba. And Mexicans, very typical of Mexicans, they embraced this instrument and just incorporated it into their music. And so this is what it sounds like. This is a band of band that somebody recorded randomly. I found it on YouTube and it's on the beach here in Mazatlan. It really does show a very typical scene that you see. If I was to go down the beach right now, I would find these bands all over the place. Here's a band and look for the tuba. Let me just pause it while you're watching it still. You'll see that banda music also involves dancing. And banda does have lyrics. It does have lyrics that are involved. It's not just instrumental. And oftentimes the lyrics are describing real life battles between drug cartels, which is a very odd thing to listen to because the music doesn't sound violent. It doesn't sound harsh but the words that are being spoken about are talk talking sometimes about battles between drug cartels. So this is a form of music that you hear all over Mexico. Now, when I went to China, which is a country that I actually taught this course in, comparative media, a few summers ago, it was the exact opposite. I hardly heard any music when I went around. I didn't hear vehicles with music on. I didn't hear people listening to radio. I saw music, or I heard music, I guess I should say, in theater productions, which we're going to talk about more today as we take on this chapter on China, but I could hardly hear any music. And yet I did hear audio while I was in the country. I can remember clearly one day I was in the dormitory and I heard this sound of what became a familiar female voice. She was saying what sounded like to me anyhow, e -u -a -a, e -u -a -a. and I decided to investigate what, what was that? I heard it every morning at the same time. So I went downstairs I went outside and I found on the on the yard of the university there were speakers that were interspersed, like loudspeakers, like stereo speakers, in the ground every few feet. And it, they were playing this woman's voice. And I thought that I had it all figured out, judging through the American lens. I thought this was something that had to do with the communist government and maybe military readiness. And maybe what they were doing was getting people to be ready in the event of a conflict. So I went to the front desk and I said, uh, I'm staying in a dormitory with a front desk, and I said, what's that lady all about? And they said, oh, the exercise lady? You were listening to the exercise lady? Yeah, the exercise lady. There's a lady that every morning coaches people into doing sit-ups, and she's being broadcast nationwide by Chinese, by Chinese, China's national government. So this is a way for me to introduce our main subject for today, to talk about China and to talk about what kind of a country is and how it differs from other countries. And we just have to say flat out, the main difference is it's a communist country. It's very centrally run. 
There are media types that are just not let into the country if they're too vulgar. A lot of Western media forums that depict prostitution, infidelity, drugs, corruption. A lot of those kinds of content, a lot of the content in those kinds of films are not allowed in the country. But communism is not necessarily what we think it to be through the view of our media where we automatically dismiss it. It's automatically bad, etc. As in the case of the exercise lady. Here you have a whole nation that is, uh, has an interest in using media to promote health and fitness through the exercise lady. And in fact, you can see that much of Chinese media policy is once again designed to encourage culture in the country. Communism does have as one of its barometers of success the idea of lifting people's tastes, their aesthetic tastes, their artistic appreciation up to higher levels. Uh, media content is just not meant to be automatically dumbing people down, although you find plenty of that in China as well. China, though, is a very interesting country. It can't really ca be categorized as communist because it has a communist political system, which means that there's only one legitimate party. No other parties are legitimate, so why should we have one run? It doesn't make sense. Only the communist party is a legitimate party that has the nation's best interests in mind. That's part of the communist ideology. And so the party is everything. And in fact, you're not allowed to criticize government at all. You're allowed to criticize, I guess I should say, you are allowed to criticize municipal governments, small town governments, as long as, as, long as the criticism in, in the form of media, news reports, documentaries, etc., is actually aimed at corruption. But you cannot criticize the political system in China itself. It has, it's, it's entrenched. It's a one-party government. However, it also has a huge sector of capitalistic activity in China. China is extremely capitalistic. There is a lot of money being made in China. There is a lot of advertising. There's a lot of free market sales, so to speak, supply and demand, all bases of capitalism. So it's not an easily categorized country. It's a country that's still continuing to evolve through change as it incorporates more capitalism into its economy while still retaining control over the content of what is discussed on media, particularly when it comes to serious news and particularly when it comes to political parties. So let's start with our intro now, a little bit late in getting to the intro in, in our guest lecture today, but I wanted to get across those ideas. And so my beginning statement here is that, the, and the chapter says this, that show business is at the core of of Chinese media in the areas of theater, motion pictures, and television show business. And I can tell you one of the earliest forms of theater is actually one of the main media content types for television in China today and film, and it's called the Melody Opera, the Melody Opera, which is sort of a variation on the telenovela, sort of a variation on the soap opera, except it's a melody opera where Chinese people are wearing elaborate costumes and dress. I will send you a link for that today. And they are singing about themes that relate to values between human beings, like sharing or like honor or dignity. That's what they're singing about, really high abstract ideals in Chinese opera and these elaborate costumes singing operatic type tunes. To us, the voice will sound very high pitched. We're not used to that kind of singing. It's an Asian kind of singing. You also hear it in uh, India, very high pitched. But this is China. It's, it's very much formed around this kind of pageantry, a kind of tradition and dress and um, an operatic, you know, elitist kind of musical quality. And China talks about its media industry as being part of the culture industry. The culture industry is film. And what China is trying to do through that film industry, as well as other media in its country, is to rejuvenate itself in the eyes of the world. China has a big problem across the world. The world is very scared of China. The world doesn't understand China. The world thinks China is very exotic. And China has the problem of getting people to access Chinese content when it's in the Chinese language, because even though it's the most spoken language in the world, it's mostly only spoken in China by all the people who are living there. And you don't have many people that, who are able to take in Chinese content like they're able to take in Spanish content or French content, even though that's not their native tongue. So uh, let's move on now to the film industry. The film industry is governed mostly by the Ministry of the Cultures Film Bureau. So you have the Ministry of Culture, and then it has a Film Bureau. 
And the industry was nationalized in 1953. It means it was taken over by the government, paid for by the government, funded by the government. All the actors were hired by the government. The script writing was done by the government. And that's because at that time, film was used as a, as a tool of propaganda. And propaganda is not discussed in a bad way in China. They actually have a, a ministry of propaganda. And so Chinese films produced during the 50s were all about promoting Chinese communism and talking about how the, the party of communism really has China headed in the right direction, education and health and scientific development. It, it was all about propaganda and making sure that that uh, films were supporting um, an ideology that the government was trying to get across. But that started to go away because co-production started to take place. We talked about this last time. We talked about Japan. We talked about it in terms of regionalization. It's another term for co-production, China producing films with, with other Asian countries, other Asian countries coming into China and producing under strict um, observation. You don't just go into China and do what you want. You're, you're monitored in China. In the 1990s, though, film started to fall off. Chinese people were, were not watching film. The attendance went way down. So China did decide that they were going to let in 10 foreign blockbuster films, only blockbuster films, films that were really big because the Chinese audience was showing an interest in American films. They had a big interest in American films, but they were only going to allow 10 in. And then come, along comes this other government agency, lots of government agencies discussed in this chapter, really tough to keep track of them. They all have a lot of very, uh, strong authority. These, this one's called the SARFT, or State, Administ State Administration for Radio, Film, and Television. And what this government entity did, among other things, is it went to the United States and it studied the television film distribution system. How are films made? How are they distributed for money? How does the, that whole system work? And they brought some ideas back to China and then they raised the limit to 34 imports per year that could come into China. It's not many, right? When you consider the US is making probably around about 800 films a year. So 34 per year, not just from the US, from other countries as well. And foreign studios that are producing films um, and then distributing them in China, they have to pay an administrative fee. So that cuts into some of the profits and also de-incentivizes some uh, foreign production companies trying to get films into China. At the same time, the uh, Chinese government tried to stimulate its own domestic consumption by providing incentives to theaters in China who would take in more revenue from films that are local than films that are foreign. They have to get at least 55% of their revenue coming from showing of local films in their theaters compared to more. So China, like other film industries that we've seen, we've seen that in Japan, we've seen that in some of our European countries, trying to stimulate that film industry because it's not necessarily working to their liking on its own. And it does demonstrate communism, right? It's film industry is not left to under the supply and demand. It's influenced by Chinese, try, Chinese policy trying to influence the cost of that process. Mm -hmm. Moving over to television now. Television is really all about the CCTV uh, China Central Television. And in fact, if you look on your cable channel right here in the U.S., you can probably find CCTV 9. You should look it up. CCTV 9, that's the international channel for CCTV. CCTV has 50 channels, 50 broadcast channels, 50, all funded by the Chinese government. And CCTV 9 is designed to promote a good image of China across the world, not portrayed as this mystical, ancient culture, ancient backwards culture that's polluting the world and, and ripping people off with uh, imitating products and selling fake products all over this. That's the image that China is trying to get away from through CCTV and through other incentives, other programs and promotions within the government. Advertising is allowed on Chinese media, even though it's communist, even though it's public service media, advertising is allowed. And CCTV also imports serial dramas. We're really starting to learn in this class that the drama has become a very important television and online streaming form of programming, and CCTV is getting into the act as well. 
which now takes us to our final element for today, which is talking about online media in China. And China does have this ministry of propaganda, and they do have an entire entire internet police force that they employ that are monitoring people's internet activities in China to make sure that there is no dissension going on. There is no criticism of the communist political system. There is no criticism of the president of China. There's no criticism of China's treatment of Taiwan and other nations, and Taiwan is a breakaway republic trying to be its own country. China says, no, you're not. So none of this can happen online. Otherwise, you might get disappeared, you might get fined, you might get picked up. In the old days in general, not just talking about Chinese media, but in the old days, you would be censored. You would, as a Chinese journalist, you would have to send your story to a Chinese government official. They would look at it and they found something they didn't like. They just line it out and you couldn't write it. You couldn't deliver it in a broadcast story, radio or TV. That, that was it. Today, the shift has been to self-censorship for the most part. But everybody in China knows the score by now. You, not everybody, but people know the score. You know what you're allowed to get away with and what, what you cannot do. And so you censor yourself. It's, it's still a form of strong regulation, strong arming. You might consider authoritarianism, but the shift has been somewhat subtle. China does have major internet companies. We've got Baidu, B-A-I-D-U. That's their biggest search engine. It's actually the biggest search engine in all of Asia. Um, then we have the, com the company Alibaba, Alibaba is an e-commerce company, you know, trading stocks and trading financial information. And then you have this huge internet gaming company called Tencent, T-E-N-C-E-N-T. -E -E and then you have China's Facebook. I can remember when I was in my dorm room, I tried to get onto Facebook while I was over there. It wouldn't let me. It just says page not available, I think is what it said. And that's because it's blocked in China. It's a Western influence. They don't want necessarily spreading Western values. So they have their own Facebook there, it's called WeChat or Weibo is the Chinese version. It's got a billion people that are using it um, every day compared to two billion using Facebook. So even though China has a much larger population than the United States, the U.S. is around 340,000. China, last I look, was like 1.4 billion people. It's more than four times. It's about four times as many people. It really shows you the market dominance of Facebook when it's got 2 billion users and China is, is still at 1 billion with its WeChat. Also, internet companies in China are making movies. One of the biggest movies was Monster Hunt that was made and distributed by an internet company. And so this is going to wrap up our conversation on China. It's a brand new country in many ways, but it's still a very old country. It's a country that has elements to its media system that are difficult to understand because of this unique political system that they have that's combining uh, political uh, uh, political autocratic uh, political authoritarianism with with free market economic principles very, very tough, difficult to get our handle on as Americans especially only learning about China through American media but you can learn about China through Chinese media through CCTV 9 have a great day